Welcome to uh, tonight's program. It's good to see you all. Uh, I'm Clarence Lang, Interim Director of the Hall Center for the Humanities, uh, which has organized this event, which is also being sponsored by the Friends of the Hall Center uh, as part of the Center's Humanities Lecture Series. So I wanna thank the Friends, uh, as well as the Chair of the Friends Council, Tom Brown. I don't think I've seen Tom, but thank him anyway. Um, it, it's, it really is our, our pleasure to bring you Brian Donovan, uh, who's an associate professor of sociology here at the University of Kansas, where he specializes in gender, racial and sexual politics, respectability, and law and culture in the early 20th century. Dr. Donovan is the author of several articles and books, most recently the book, Respectability on Trial, Sex Crimes in New York City, 1900 to 1918, which several reviewers have praised for its careful research compelling arguments and important interventions in the field. And, and I will say that I've had the good fortune of working with Brian um, in his capacity as a member of the uh, Hall Center's Executive Committee. And next academic year, he will be a resident humanities research fellow at the Center. Um, and Brian's remarks tonight, um, I presume, will draw from the work that he will be continuing during this residency. And in the meantime, you'll take your questions after his talk. Uh, I ask that you make your way to one of the microphones um, in the aisles that the uh, Hall Center staff have arranged for your use. And um, after the event is over, there will be light refreshments, punch and cookies in the lobby. So I hope that you're able to stay around for that. Um, now, at our speaker's own request, uh, I have asked Ann Schofield to introduce Dr. Donovan this evening. Um, Dr. Schofield is, uh, is professor of women, gender, and sexuality studies here at KU, where she has been a faculty member since 1979. Um, that's right, you can clap for that, that's good, yeah. Um, the things that you learn, learn about your colleagues, I didn't notice, but, but by training, Anne is, a, is, is an historian, um, having earned her PhD from the State University of New York. Her research concerns historical analyses of gender and class with a focus on U.S. working class women, respectability, and American culture in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, an interdisciplinary scholar, uh, and she was doing that before the term became popular, um, she has served as director of women's studies, when it was women's studies, as well as taught in the departments of history and American studies, in the latter case serving as director of graduate studies. Dr. Schofield has been a recipient of many awards and honors. I won't go uh, on and on droning, um, but some of them have, have included the, the Kemper Award for Outstanding Graduate Teaching and Advising, and membership in the Hall of Fame for the, M for the Emily Taylor Center for Women and Gender Equity. Uh, so uh, clearly, Brian could not have made a better choice of an esteemed scholar on campus and in the profession to introduce him. And I hope that all of you will please help me welcome Ann Schofield. Thank, thank you, Clarence. Yes, I have a genuine, I'm a genuine old time bar here at, uh, uh, or I remember when Paradise was the only restaurant in town. You know, that's the usual. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely honored and delighted this evening to have the, inter the opportunity to introduce our speaker, Brian Donovan. Uh, Brian became a member of KU's sociology department in 2001, thus becoming the first, and I believe still the only fluent Klingon speaker in the department. <laughs> Yes, now, am, am I right? Are there other Klingon speakers? You, you, you are, well, maybe so, all right, then I, I stand, still the only. Um, uh, I didn't meet Brian until about 2006 when we discovered our shared enthusiasm for the topic of respectability. By that time, Brian had published his first book, White Slave Crusades, Race, Gender, and Anti-Vice Activism, 1887-1917, which established him as an important emerging voice in historical sociology. His second book, um, as Clarence mentioned, Respectability on Trial, Sex Crimes in New York City, 1900-1918, was in part supported by a prestigious NEH fellowship 
and it was published two years ago. Based on an enormous collection of trial transcripts uh, that came in a almost secret uh, cache to the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, Brian was able to analyze this material to show, and here I quote, that courtroom struggles illustrate between 1900 and 1918 in microcosm, a clash between competing ideological frameworks. On the one hand, well-established ideas of feminine respectability and emerging ideas about women's sexual agencies. And on the one hand, manhood defined by marriage and responsibility. On the other hand, new freedoms available to bachelors and to men who exhibited non-hegemonic ideas of manhood. In other words, striking evidence that in the first decades of the 20th century, the first sexual revolution in America was well underway. In addition to his substantial scholarly achievements, Brian is a notable teacher of cultural sociology, sociology of the law, causation of crime and delinquency, and more. He's been awarded two of the highest teaching awards at KU, the Silver Anniversary Award in 2007 and the Jean Budig Award in 2016. In addition to these achievements, and I say this from personal experience, Brian is the most generous of colleagues, both in his department and outside of his department. For example, he co-directs the gender seminar at the Hall Center, he has co-edited the Sociological Quarterly and has served as a manuscript referee for a long list of journals. Tonight, Brian is going to share with us material from his intriguing new project, American Gold Digger, Law, Culture, and Marriage in the Early 20th Century. So please, join me in welcoming a scholar, a teacher, a colleague, a fluent Klingon speaker, <laughs> and a master bridge player. Uh, my partner in respectability, if not in crime, Brian Donovan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for that incredibly nice introduction. And I'd also like to thank folks from the Hall Center, Clarence Lang, Sarah Bishop, Andrew Hodgson, and Elliot Reeder for organizing all of this. And a special thanks to Chris Stedman from the Wheat Law Library and Sarah Morris from the Watson Library. My research wouldn't be possible without generous assistance from many University of Kansas librarians, especially those two. And thanks to all of you for coming out to hear me talk about gold diggers. I can't guarantee that tonight will be as exciting as the game last night, but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. So let's start in New York City, 1918. This is Kay Laurel, elite Ziegfeld Folly star, billed at the time as the girl with the most wonderful figure in the world, friend of H.L. Mencken, Helen Hayes, and Reginald Vanderbilt. She was in the lobby of the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, and her friend entered, and she greeted her, hello, gold digger. Laurel was sitting with playwright Avery Hopwood, and Hopwood had never before heard the phrase gold digger, so he asked her what it meant. And she allegedly told him, that's what we call ourselves. You men capitalize on your brains, your business ability, your legal minds, or whatever other darn thing you happen to have, so why shouldn't we girls capitalize on what nature has given us? You men don't give something for nothing, so why should we? Hopwood wrote the phrase gold digger down on his white shirt cuff. <laughs> A year later, Broadway producer David Belasco approached Hopwood about writing a play to promote 
actor and former Ziegfeld star Ina Clare. Hopwood recalled his conversation with Laurel and produced a script for The Gold Diggers, a play about three chorus girls struggling to survive in Manhattan. Belasco loved the script, but he urged Hopwood to change the title. The phrase gold digger was not in common parlance, and Belasco worried that audience members, upon seeing the title, would expect a play about prospectors, mining, <laughs> or the gold rush. In fact, Variety Magazine, in its review of the play, helpfully clarified, the piece does not concern the mining of precious metal. <laughs> Well, Hopwood kept the title, and The Gold Diggers was an enormous success. It ran for 280 performances at the Lyceum Theater on Broadway. It had a successful run in London with Tallulah Bankhead in the starring role. It was the basis for the wildly popular Warner Brothers musical comedy, The Gold Diggers of 1933, the second highest grossing Warner Brothers film that year. A decade before, it was made into a silent film in 1923, now lost. A few years later, it was made into a Warner Brothers comedy called The Gold Diggers of Broadway, which was filmed using an early color film technique called two-strip technicolor. Now, most of the film is lost but fragments of the film have been discovered just in the last three years. So to get us thinking about Gold Diggers, I'd like to play for you a short clip. The sound is reasonable, but there's only film footage for a brief moment, so I use some visual placeholders when I put this together. What is it, a diamond necklace? Now, don't you dare give me a diamond necklace. I'm trying to restrain myself. Oh, I know what it is. A nice little bitty automobile. What about four or five yachts? Nope, I always get seasick. But a car? Ah, oh, not one of those great big foreign cars. Just this simple little Lincoln. Something very cheap. <gasps> maybe purple with ducky green wheels. And of course, I need a chauffeur. Now, maybe please wait a moment. I tell you what, let's do. What? More fun, sweetie. Let's take a car and drive down to Automobile Row and Window Shop. And if we see anything we like, we'll buy it in the morning. No, 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 no. I'm sleepy and I, I want to go to bed. Come on, the fresh air will do you. No, no, I don't, I, don't, oh. I don't want to go window shopping, no. Oh. In fact, I can't afford to buy you a car. Oh, yes, you can. No, I cannot. Oh, yes, you can. No, I... <laughs> oh, what's the juice? Maybe, don't you see... It would hurt your reputation if I were to buy you a car. Oh, that's right. Yes. People would talk, wouldn't they, Tweety? Well, of course. You see, a man doesn't buy a, a girl a car unless he's engaged or married or something. Oh, Tweety, you're the nosy. No, I'm not. Oh, no, 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 no. You, you, you have nothing in handwriting. Oh. You, you have no witnesses. Sweetie, the phone. Sweetie, the phone. Please, 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 I wonder if Rover would take you. Eh? Oh, I could never marry a man the Rover didn't like. But my sister takes to you. Oh, yes, I forgot all about your sister. Oh, don't you remember, sweetie? We're twins. Aren't you glad? If anything happens to me, you'll always have her. <laughs> In that clip, Mabel, played by Winnie Leitner, is trying to manipulate a wealthy lawyer named Blake played by Albert Grant. And in Leitner's performance, we see a distillation of the gold digger type. Childlike, aggressive, manipulative, frivolous. She doesn't care about her reputation. And despite her obvious lack of cultural capital, she's able to cast a kind of undue influence over the reasoning ability of the wealthy lawyer. By the late 1920s, no one at Warner Brothers was worried that the audience would misunderstand the phrase gold digger. Various representations of gold diggers on stage, on screen, and in print media weakened the inexorable association between mining and the phrase gold digging. <laughs> the gold digger had become a stereotype, a category of womanhood. 
tonight, I'm going to explain some of the cultural force of the gold digger stereotype in the first few decade, decades of the 20th century. I'm interested in how cultural representations of gold diggers form a synergistic relationship with the legal realm, where action is taken against and sometimes on behalf of alleged gold diggers. This is part of a book that I'm writing about the gold digger figure in American culture, a book that traces the gold digger from a casual conversation between a Ziegfeld Folly star and a playwright to the trials and tribulations of Anna Nicole Smith in the 1990s. This evening, I'll explain the role of the gold digger stereotype in alimony reform in the late 1920s and so-called heart balm reform in the 1930s. That's heart balm, B-A-L-M. But before I talk to you about alimony reform and heart balm, I'd like to explain just briefly the theoretical framing and orientation of my research. And in a talk ostensibly about gold diggers, I'll begin with a somewhat odd statement. Gold diggers do not exist. Sure, we could establish the objective existence of gold diggers by creating criteria for gold digging and standards for the gold diggers, but those criteria and standards will say more about the individuals constructing them than they will about the gold diggers themselves. And they will contain unexamined assumptions about gender and social class. When I say that gold diggers do not exist, I mean that gold diggers are not a freestanding human type. They're not a kind of social species. Instead, taking a page from the sociology of deviance, I argue that gold diggers exist to the extent that people make claims about their existence. To quote sociologist Howard Becker, the deviant is one to whom that label has been successfully applied. Deviant behavior is behavior that people so label. Accordingly, gold diggers are best thought of as a construct. They are a stereotype. And the gold digger is a gendered stereotype. Some men are described as gold diggers. Gold digging is described in some same-sex relationships. But the dominant image of the gold digger for most of the 20th century is a woman who uses her sexuality and charm to seduce a man into a relationship where she can profit. I've seen references to quote unquote male gold diggers, but those rare references to explicitly male gold diggers does not undo the gendered valence of the stereotype. Rather, it, those references underscore the fact that the gold digger by default refers to women. The gold digger has more or less a consistent presence throughout the 20th century. Yet rhetoric about gold diggers and anxiety about gold digging reached white hot intensity during specific historical moments. Especially when older understandings of marriage and courtship were challenged, when women asserted new forms of power, and when the law failed to keep pace with those social changes. The gold digger appears and reappears as a folk devil in moral panics around marriage, money, and law. The sociological concept of moral panic refers to an exaggerated response to a perceived social problem. Folk devils are the targets of moral panic. They are the witches of the witch hunt. Moral panics are designed to identify and eliminate folk devils and to restore the hegemonic moral order and social control. Now, the gold digger as folk devil story will become more complicated when I dig into the historical material, but this, I think, is the best place to start. Finally, gold diggers appear as characters in a specific genre of moral panic, what sociologists of law call tort tales. Tort tales are exaggerated stories of lawsuits that work to epitomize and symbolize dysfunctions in the realm of civil law. 
Creators of the tort tale concept argue that tort tales are unique to the culture wars of the late 20th century. But as I'll show later in my talk, that's a very presentist and ahistorical understanding of the tort tale concept. Back to the gold diggers. It's nearly impossible to talk about early 20th century gold diggers without discussing Peggy Hopkins Joyce. Peggy Hopkins Joyce was best known as a gold digger, if not the gold digger of the early 20th century. Stories of Peggy Joyce, her stardom as a Ziegfeld Folly star, her multiple marriages to millionaires, her tempestuous divorce from Stanley Joyce in 1921, her demand from Stanley that he pay her $10,000 a month in alimony. These stories found an audience of hundreds of thousands in newspapers, magazines, and tabloids. Peggy Joyce's glamorous image, promoted in the press and nurtured by her conscious effort at celebrity, embodied the gold digger at a moment in American cultural history when that image had wide social salience. In fact, Anita Luz refers to Peggy Hopkins Joyce in her 1925 novel, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. And some people then and now can contend that Peggy Hopkins Joyce was the real life inspiration for the novel's protagonist, Lorelei Lee. That's not quite accurate, but it suggests the extent to which Peggy Hopkins Joyce was part of the cultural fabric. She was a household name who is now all but forgotten, unless you're writing a book about gold diggers. <laughs> Although she was celebrated in some quarters for her glamour, her entrepreneurship, and her pluck, she was often portrayed as a menace who preyed upon weak and wealthy men. These images from the Chicago Daily Tribune and the Washington Post show her drawn as a monstrous figure. In the one, she's toying with the wealthy man as if he were a puppet. In the other, she's towering over Stanley Joyce, demanding that he offer up his wealth. Criticism of the alimony system, which gained steam in the early 1920s and reached a fever pitch by the second half of the decade, drew strength from stories about Peggy Hopkins Joyce. But by 1926, stories of teenage Francis Peaches Browning worked to supplant Peggy Hopkins Joyce as the archetypal gold digger. The front page of the Chicago Daily Tribune for April 19th, 1926, marked this transition with a six panel comic under the title, Who is the World's Most Interesting Person Today? The comic featured, along with Mussolini and Henry Ford, Francis Peaches Browning and Peggy Hopkins Joyce. So on your right, we see Peggy Hopkins Joyce and it says, that she is a close second behind Peaches Browning in national notoriety. And it says she gets married so often, the marriage statistics can't keep up with her. Now, by that time in 1926, Peggy Hopkins Joyce was on her third marriage. Uh, so I think the marriage statistics could keep up with her just fine, but <laughs> that comment suggests the extent to which there was still considerable stigma around divorce, and it hints at the growing anxiety about divorce during the 1920s. The panel on the left shows a throng of people packed tightly around a smiling girl wearing a hat and furs. And below it, it says, New York City seems convulsed about Peaches Browning the 15-year-old bride. Teenage Frances Heenan married 51-year-old Edward Browning in April 1926. He referred to Frances as Peaches, and she referred to him as Daddy. 
I know. If you want to learn more about Peaches Browning and changing notions of childhood, I enthusiastically refer you to chapter seven of Nick Surrett's book, American Child Bride. Here I want to note the connection and timing between the Peaches Browning scandal and the push for national alimony reform in early 1927. The marriage between Peaches and Edward was short-lived. They separated. In November 1926, the lawyer for Peaches Browning filed a motion requesting that Edward pay Peaches $50,000 in alimony. And so the judge heard arguments from both parties in a crowded courthouse and eventually ruled that Edward should pay Peaches $1,200 a month in temporary alimony and $8,500 in fees. Now, that's a lot of money, especially for 1926. But it's important to keep in mind that Edward Browning was one of the wealthiest individuals of the 1920s. Before his death in 1948, he owned hundreds of buildings in Manhattan and had an estimated wealth of over $20 million. Also, it's important to keep in mind that the judge's ruling was for temporary alimony. It was a temporary ruling. The formal separation trial began in January 1927 to determine what, if anything, Edward owed Peaches in the long term. Like the divorce trial of Stanley and Peggy Joyce, the Peaches-Browning separation trial drew national press coverage. The trial lasted five days and produced a flood of sensational and scandalous media attention. To be sure, some reports portrayed Peaches as an exploited child, but many outlets depicted her as a gold digger who took advantage of Edward Browning. Harry Carr, columnist for the Los Angeles Times, said the various humane societies had best start on an entirely new tact in this Peaches Browning case. Instead of protecting the kindergarten classes from the middle-aged realty dealer, it is he who needs protection. So the judge ruled in favor of Edward Browning and said that Peaches unjustifiably abandoned her husband. He granted the request for formal separation, but he denied that Edward owed Peaches any money. The public's reaction to the judge's ruling was almost uniformly in favor of Edward Browning's legal victory. And many observers used it as an opportunity to criticize gold diggers. In his 1927 survey of American law, William Fairburn referred to the Browning case as the most sensational and disgusting divorce. And he said, this is certainly the gold digger era. R.F. Wingard, in his letter to the Chicago Daily Tribune, praised the judge's ruling and said, if Chicago judges followed this decision, we wouldn't have as many gold diggers looking for divorces and large alimony. Richard Armstrong, writing in the Virginia Law Register, excoriated the original alimony award, the preliminary award, and he insisted that Peaches would inspire other gold diggers. He said, the Browning case is just an ordinary case with extraordinary characters. Others daily meet the same fate. A judge from the District of Columbia, talking about the case in 1927, said, it seems to me that this business of divorce is, to a large degree, the business of gold diggers. These comments illustrate how thoroughly the image of the gold digger entered into the legal sphere and the discursive repertoire of the American public during the late 1920s. Representations of alleged gold diggers like Peggy Hopkins Joyce and Peaches Browning coincided with emboldened efforts to reform alimony in the late 1920s. In early 1927, as the Peaches Browning trial finished up, several states pursued alimony reforms to cap the money owed to former wives, to limit the length of alimony payments, 
and to make it easier for men to receive alimony. As judges publicly criticized alimony seekers as gold diggers, men and women created anti-alimony organizations. The American Alimony Payers Protective Association, formed in 1927, boasted of thousands of members, somewhat dubiously. In Chicago, an anti-alimony organization was created just a few months after the Peaches Browning scandal. Now, the push for alimony reform can be characterized in part as an anti-feminist backlash rooted in simple sexism. That explanation takes us pretty far. And if there are any undergraduates or graduate students in the audience who are looking for a thesis topic, let's talk because an account of the ideological links between the anti-alimony crusade of the late 1920s and the contemporary so-called men's rights movement is a tale that has yet to be told. But describing the anti-alimony crusade simply in terms of misogyny only takes us so far. Many women criticize gold diggers and alimony, and more importantly, criticisms of alimony were folded into a feminist critique of modern marriage. In a 1927 article in Harper's, First wave feminist Dorothy Dunbar Bromley said that of the three types of childless women who seek alimony, gold diggers were by far the most numerous. Novelist Faith Baldwin, who wrote an anti-alimony novel in 1928 called Alimony, also criticized the alimony system for making a mockery of women's hard-fought economic and social independence. For writers like Bromley and Baldwin, alimony represented an outdated model of marriage where men exchanged money for women's reproductive and domestic labor. So the alimony system came under fire from both conservative moralists concerned about so-called female dominance and from progressives who advocated a companionate model of marriage, a notion of marriage liberated from calculated economic exchanges between husbands and wives. Reflecting diverse ideologies and motivations, alimony was portrayed in courtrooms, in news reports, in academic works, and in popular culture as a crisis that threatened to destroy American families and the US social structure. Yet the public outcry against alimony does not align with the rate of alimony awards. Alimony was rare. According to legal historians, alimony was granted in only nine to 15% of divorces during the 1920s. Not only was alimony rare, but when it was granted, it was typically given to women who were unable to work who were disabled or who had children to support. And by the 1920s, men had devised all sorts of contrivances to avoid paying alimony. Desertion and failure to pay alimony, one could reasonably argue, were greater social problems than the issue of lavish alimony awards. The reality of alimony in the US was much more mundane than stories about gold diggers like Francis, uh, Fra uh, Peaches Browning and Peggy Hopkins Joyce suggested. My research shows that the heightened concern about alimony in the late 1920s, amplified by stories about Peggy and Peaches, was a classic moral panic. By 1929, California, Iowa, Ohio, Oregon and Washington passed laws to restrict alimony. In reference to the efforts in California, a writer for the Los Angeles Times, just months before the stock market crash of October 1929, declared, the days of the gold digger are numbered. That's a bold statement, but in retrospect, an absurd one. The gold digger construct 
took on a new life in the wake of the Great Depression. Stories about unfair alimony awards persisted, yes, but a set of tort tales about so-called heart bomb lawsuits took on special significance. Heart bomb refers to four types of lawsuit. Alienation of affection, criminal conversation, seduction, and breach of promise. And with slight variations among them, these are lawsuits that refer to a betrayal of or interference with a romantic or intimate relationship. Los Angeles, 1934. A typist named Francis Singer sued acclaimed crooner Rudy Valley for a quarter million dollars. Her lawsuit accused Valley of breach of promise, alleging that Valley agreed to marry her, but then later broke his pledge. Valley had never met Singer. According to her lawsuit, through his songs, <laughs> Valley used a musical code system to assure her of his undying love and matrimonial intentions. The suit, as you might expect, was ultimately unsuccessful, but it garnered national press coverage. And while details of the suit were unusual, litigation for so-called heart bomb received vigorous media coverage in the Depression era United States, especially breach of promise lawsuits. Newsreaders learned about the half million dollar lawsuit against violinist David Rubinoff, initiated by Peggy Garcia, a hat check clerk at the Cotton Club and a taxi dancer at the Bluebird nightclub. Rubinoff's attorney uncovered evidence that Garcia was already married to two men the breach of promise suit was thrown out of court, and she was imprisoned on charges of bigamy. The public read about Rhoda Doubleday, divorced wife of publishing giant Felix Doubleday, who brought a $1.5 million breach of promise lawsuit against Chicago multimillionaire Harry F. McCormick in 1935. The suit settled out of court for $65,000. The African American press also published accounts of costly breach of promise lawsuits. As in the white press, these narratives invoke themes of class respectability and class mobility. A 1930 case in Newark, New Jersey alleged that William Washington, a wealthy and prominent physician, promised to wed 23-year-old Ethel Cannon. Washington's husband, or Washington's wife, uh, was gravely ill, and he promised that he would marry Cannon after she died, but instead she married a white woman. Harkening back to the 1926 Peaches Browning scandal, the trial uncovered letters where Washington referred to Cannon as Peaches, and she referred to him as Daddy. The court awarded her 20,000 of the $75,000 she originally sought. In another case, Alice Piper, a 22-year-old white nurse from Iowa, sued Alvin Jefferson, an African-American doctor, for $10,000 in a breach of promise suit. A writer for the Chicago Defender praised Jefferson's character by describing him as mild-mannered, and showing every evidence of culture and refinement. Piper's respectability, however, was jeopardized in the eyes of observers by both her interracial relationship and her lawsuit. Her former employer described her as extremely refined and noted that she read only the best books and was never out once past 9.30 at night. <laughs> But Jefferson's, Jefferson's attorney called her unsophisticated, and he said that Alice Piper's motive was simply to get more money. The jury deliberated for eight hours before deciding to award Piper only $1 in damages. 
So Americans learned about heart bomb lawsuits from newspapers, but they also learned about heart bomb suits from another source, the movies. Is anybody here? I thought I'd surprise you, dear. Surprises, you floored us. You remember Gladys, don't you? Could I forget her? Hey, let me take your horse. Yes, gee, you're looking swell, Come on, Gladys. Come down. Too. Sandy, how long have you been here? Yes, oh, will you tell her Will you stop it? At the Carlton Towers, Suite 906. I can't stay very long. My limousine is chauffeur waiting. <laughs> I thought I'd drop in to say to Tom. Say, ain't it funny? Only yesterday I was saying to me. Yeah, yeah, we was wondering who you was, what you was doing. Ain't it? <laughs> Aren't you the dears? Head oil or something? My dears, I've been to Cuba, Havana. <laughs> Don't my skin look tanned? Tanned? I'd say it was embossed. What'd you do in Cuba, run the mint? Well, not exactly, but I had them worried for a little while. <laughs> oh, come on, tell us, did you marry a millionaire? No, but I've been kicking around with about 15 or 20. <laughs> Think of being knee-deep in millionaires. I can't, I get dizzy. Dears, I'm telling you the place is positively reeking with them. <laughs> The suckers. Oh, give us the dope, will you? I begin to think our education's been neglected. Oh, it's a cinch. All you've got to do is get a man by the name of Duffy. He's a lawyer down there. <laughs> he got me $60,000. And is he good? <laughs> good? He's a miracle man. How'd he work it? Breach of promise. <laughs> I met a Mr. Monaghan, a steel man. He'd have married me, only his wife objected. Wives are funny that way. Well? But it's only for 15,000. Well, what about it? That's as much as you could expect if your case had been on the level. What's your usual rake off or breach of promise? But he settled uh, for 25,000. Sure, but don't you think I get mine? Hello, Tyra, darling. Honey? How are you? You look so marvelous. Come right in, sit right down, make yourself at home. Now, let me look at that beautiful smile of yours. Do you know about me going to be married? Yeah, sure. Congratulations. It's too late. It's all off. And I want you to sue the guy for breach of promise. Certainly. The low life. No, he ain't, Benny. The first guy I ever really loved. I thought he loved me, too. What a tragedy. We start proceedings immediately. How much is he worth? Millions. Millions? We sue him for, uh, for damages. I ain't damaged. I just want you to sue him for breach of promise. I got all the proof you want. Letters, wires, newspaper stories, even my trousseau. For that trousseau alone, we collect plenty. It's a siege. When do you want the case tried? Oh, let me see. I go on the road with the show, and I'll be back in a few months. Better start then. Oh, is that the case? Well, darling, you give me a few details and I'll sort him with papers right away. Okay. First, I'll tell you how I met the guy. But remember, in anything I say, I ain't got no real animosity for him. Of course. Of course. Of course. If I was a home girl, I'd be heartbroken. Yes, yes, yes. Now, Miss Tyra, I understand you've had a rather colorful past. Well, I, I gotta admit, I've been the love interest in more than one guy's life. I don't see what my past has got to do with my present. We shall show that to the satisfaction of the court, I believe. Nevertheless, the fact remains that you've been on friendly terms with several men. All right, I'm the sweetheart of Sigma Psi, so what? <laughs> You must answer questions directly, please. Oh, uh, pardon me, Judge. Proceed. So in Havana Widows, the out-of-work chorus girls played by Joan Blondell and Glenda Farrell learned about the financial potential for breach of promise lawsuits and we can surmise that viewers of the movie learned about that too. These clips, especially the last one, suggest something else about gold diggers. The possibility for the gold digger to be an aspirational figure, 
not just a simple folk devil. In an era of economic crisis, Mae West appears to be in charge of her future. Cary Grant is falling in love with her. She has the judge wrapped around her finger. She's surviving and thriving during the Great Depression, and she's using the legal system to do so. She and other gold diggers illustrate the gold digger's capacity to be a trickster, one who undermines society's power structure with parody, irony, and humor. We find this argument in some of the scant academic literature on gold diggers. For instance, film and gender scholar Pamela Robertson describes the gold digger performances of Mae West as what she calls feminist camp. This is uh, Chester Morris and Jean Harlow from the 1932 film Redheaded Woman. Jessica Hope Jordan, a film scholar, describes Harlow's gold digger performances as illustrating what she calls proto-feminist agency. But while moviegoers might have been laughing with the gold diggers, laughing at the gold diggers, or desiring to be the gold diggers, and while contemporary film and literary scholars can discern agency and a subversive potential in the gold digger figure, journalists, politicians, and others in positions of power during the 1930s were sounding an alarm about gold diggers and the abuse of heartbomb lawsuits. They used the discourse of gold digging to portray breach of promise suits in particular as a national menace. Journalist Mary Wynne warned against the large army of American gold diggers using breach of promise suits. Frank Garbutt, a Los Angeles industrialist, advocated for adequate protection for poor, weak, susceptible men from the wiles of designing alimony and breach of promise gold diggers. Echoing that excerpt from Lawyer Man, the editorial page of the Chicago Daily Tribune stated in 1935, suits for breach of promise have become a stench in the nostrils of everyone except gold diggers and unscrupulous lawyers who support themselves on this kind of practice. Opponents of Hartbaum drew a firm boundary between respectable women on one hand and gold diggers on the other. For example, novelist and journalist Kathleen Norris wrote in the Salt Lake Tribune in 1935, when we pick up our morning newspaper and see the injured woman, when we study her vapid face and permanent wave, we know perfectly well that not a natural tear has ever fallen from those bright, calculating eyes, <coughs> that the thick lacquer of that soft, characterless mouth has never been jeopardized by a tremble. She went on. It is humiliating to balanced women to read day after day of the Peaches and Rhodas and Peggies, whose fantastic affairs of the heart are spread so lavishly over the front pages of the morning paper. She said, not the most desperate poverty would force a woman of any fineness to such a step. Here, Norris aligned herself with opponents of Hartbaum as a way to distinguish herself and her achievements from gold diggers. For Hartbaum critics, what was once a relatively acceptable method of maintaining class and gender respectability became a tool of debasement and blackmail in the hands of chorus girls, working class women, and others trying to marry above their social position. So by the mid-1930s, several states moved to ban Hartbaum lawsuits. And the first state to do so was Indiana, and the effort was led by the state's only woman congressperson, Roberta West Nicholson. Nicholson made various arguments, arguments against Hartbaum before the Indiana legislature. She said, I am convinced most actions for breach of promise have extortion as their chief motive. This I seek to prevent through the adoption of this bill. 
She said that she wanted young people to understand that marriage is a divine sacrament, not a commercial agreement. As I see my bill, she said, it is symbolic of a change in attitude toward women. We don't want to see inferior women pull down our sex. This is an image from the Roseburg News Review uh, newspaper from Oregon. And on the right, it shows Roberta West Nicholson. And on the left, it shows nightclub performer and heart bomb recipient Vera Grove. The juxtaposition of the two women epitomizes the respectability politics into which heart bomb re reform played. So heart bomb reform represented a way to block gold diggers from abusing the civil justice system. And this is represented succinctly in a few editorial cartoons. This one from the Evansville Courier portrays Nicholson's Law as a protector of true love and a shield that repels gold diggers. This comic, which appeared in the Chicago Daily Tribune just a few weeks after the passage of the Indiana law, shows a gold digger who is prevented from collecting heart bomb because of Nicholson's legislation. And the title reads, the old diggings ain't what they used to be. In a third comic from an Ohio newspaper, John Coons predicted that breach of promise suits would be as extinct as the dodo bird. Now, that was an overstatement, but he was correct to note that the action taken by Indiana had spread to other states. By 1940, 10 states across the country had passed laws to restrict or outlaw heart bomb lawsuits. In Iowa, their heart bomb bill included a provision of a fine of $100 to $1,000 for merely threatening to sue. The image of the gold digger, as you might expect at this point in my talk, held a prominent place in the rhetoric leading to the creation of these laws. And as in Indiana, upper class women played a prominent role in promoting them. For example, in 1937, a congressperson from Denver sponsored an anti heart bomb bill in the Colorado legislature. And when it passed, she said, that's the end of the gold digger in Colorado courts. The following month, Democratic Congressperson Catherine Foley from Lawrence, Massachusetts, introduced an anti-heart bomb bill in her state, declaring that such lawsuits were nothing but a gold digging racket. Yet there is no evidence that heart bomb lawsuits were either increasing in frequency or were being especially abused. According to historian Julie Barabitsky, Historians have found nothing to substantiate the claim that heart bomb cases were especially disposed to extortion or invention, and legal records show a diversity of plaintiffs. Substantiation is also lacking for reformers' assertion that the juries handed down excessive awards to pretty plaintiffs plain innocent. And it also needs to be mentioned that threats faced by women in the 1930s, like sexual violence, harassment, and workplace discrimination received far less public attention compared to cries about heart bomb and gold diggers. The rush to outlaw heart bomb lawsuits, like the crusade against alimony years before, was not a consequence of a sudden increase in these lawsuits. The panic over heart bomb developed from a series of tort tales. The public's momentum against heart bomb, which reached a crescendo in the middle and late 1930s, was driven by a confluence of structural and cultural dynamics. Structurally, the Great Depression exacerbated the precarious position of women's paid employment. And it strained the politics of respectability that surrounded marriage as a path to avoid poverty. Culturally, Gold digger narratives provided a ready-made folk devil through which the public could understand the heart bomb debate. So to conclude, 
the gold digger is a construct with consequences. Tracing the cultural force of the gold digger stereotype in the United States reveals the powerful and intertwined relationships among law, popular culture, and gender inequality. From chorus girl slang to a complicated folk devil in debates about marriage law, the gold digger has had a remarkable life over the 20th century. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share with you part of her story. That's, that's my main argument. The, the question, if you didn't hear over here, is, uh, was criticism of gold diggers way out of line? And um, I think those instances of ext uh, extreme aw uh, legal awards given to certain alleged gold diggers, if you take those instances in isolation, you, could, you might say, yes, that's, that's an unfair award, or um, she didn't deserve that, perhaps. But if you look at it in total, if you look at alimony awards in general, or heart bomb in general, then those rare instances are used to justify and explain the entirety of it. And that's, that's what I'm trying to show with this, uh, by, by referring to this as a, a moral panic. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm really tempted to ask the Stormy Daniels question, but somebody else is going to have to do that. Uh, going back to the very, very first film you showed that with the, uh, the Gold Diggers of Broadway, um, you, you made the comment that the Gold Digger was, was childlike. And, and that, particular, um, that particular character was enormous. I mean, she was almost baby talking. She was so childlike. Mm -hmm. Whereas, whereas the others seem much sexier, much more mature, you know, much more womanly wiles. And so I'm wondering if that childlike aspect drops out or continues or, I mean, it certainly seems that there's a reality to it since Peaches is 15, but, but does the childlikeness continue into the, into the 30s? Uh, and then someone else can ask about Stormy Daniels. No, that, that's a great question. I think there is a, a kind of discursive flexibility to the gold digger image, and being childlike is part of that. We see references to Michelle Triola, who is a gold digger that I talk about in a later chapter, a, a, an alleged gold digger from the 1970s, who's described as childlike. Uh, Anna Nicole Smith allegedly used baby talk when she interacted with her, her husband. And so I think that the, the childlike image is part of the gold digger stereotype, but I don't think all gold diggers necessarily embody that childlike quality. And I think what we're seeing in, in Mae West and some of the more mature or sultry representations of the gold digger is a, a bit of the vamp which is uh, a kind of character type or stereotype from the, the late 19th century and early 20th century, that the, the vamp and the gold digger in some ways are interlocking circles. But it's a good question. Uh, kind of a wild question here. Sure. Um, is the Me Too movement, is it do you think it might be subject to a kind of a dynamic that under underlie the gold digger kind of thing? I I think what you're you might be asking is is, is there a moral panic quality to the Me Too yeah, movement? Yes. Uh, yes. I I disagree. I think that's it, um, the moral panic concept gets at an exaggerated response. 
uh, to a perceived social problem, and I think what the Me Too movement is responding to is very real. But what I think your question gets at, and I think it's, it's legitimate, is that the concept of moral panic has a kind of I know it when I see it quality, that it, it has a polemic side to it where it, it could be used to um, criticize collective action in certain ways. Uh, and I think that that's, that's a weakness of it as a kind of academic uh, or analytic lens. But thank you. Um. I won't ask the Stormy Daniels question. Okay. But, but I'll frame it this way, and maybe you can get at it if you want to. Um, in, in your work, and this may be beyond, and you can feel free to say that this is, you're not really sort of dealing with this question. But I mean, I think to, to, to Ann's point, uh, the issue of uh, presidential politics, that there's maybe a parallel kind of a narrative, and I don't know if that conforms to the, the gold digger stereotype or, or trope or what, or what have you, but if we think about you know, um, the uh, uh, presidents from John F. Kennedy moving forward and even moving backward, um, how does that, if it, all, if it does at all, inform or intersect with or parallel the themes that you're, that you're dealing with. Maybe it is not the gold digger. Maybe what we're talking about is the mistress. Maybe that's a, a, mm -hmm. an entirely different kind of narrative. But um, I'm giving you an opportunity if you want to talk about Stormy Daniels, or you can talk about <laughs> something related to that. So yeah. I'll punt on that. But it's interesting that the, the, the example of a president that you gave was, is Kennedy. And and he had an alleged affair with uh, Marilyn Monroe. My uh, ex extensive reading on Marilyn Monroe suggests that, that um, there, there wasn't much evidence of an ongoing affair. But he is certainly tied to Marilyn Monroe in kind of the, the cultural memory of that, that presidency. And Marilyn Monroe, it's interesting because she very much consciously modeled her presentation of self off of Jean Harlow. Jean Harlow was her idol. And from the platinum blonde to the, the skin tight dresses, the, the way of talking, that baby talk that Harlow has, that uh, Marilyn Monroe has, all of that was something that uh, Marilyn Monroe consciously um, crafted for her identity. And so I think it's. It's interesting that her, the, the memory of Marilyn Monroe is so intimately tied up with our um, memories of, of John F. Of Kennedy. And I think what's interesting about Monroe is that she was often seen as, in real life, as embodying her characters. That is, she was seen as unintelligent. She was seen as the kind of quintessential dumb blonde. And that couldn't be further from the, the truth. She was quite brilliant. It's, it's, if you read enough about Marilyn Monroe, you can understand why someone like Norman Mailer would want to marry her, or why someone like John F. Kennedy would want to associate with her. So uh, I didn't talk about Stormy Daniels, but it gave me an opportunity to say a little bit about Marilyn Monroe, which I'm always eager to do. Interesting. I oh, um, Ruth, did you? I was just curious. I was really interested in um, the way the moral panic was tied up with tort reform. And um, I'm just kind of curious how it situates with the history of tort reform and moral panic in the United States. Because I know I was thinking about the McDonald's coffee suit right. while you were talking, and then also just the debate around um, healthcare in this country and mm -hmm. um, kind of the fascination with that like unreasonable lawsuit um, and the demonization of, of, of that kind of approach. Right, the, the, McDon the McDonald's coffee spill case is the quintessential tort tale of the late 20th century. So if you're not familiar with this uh, or don't remember it, in the, the 1990s, uh, an elderly woman named Stella Lebeck spilled a cup of coffee and it caused third degree burns. And she sued McDonald's initially for, I, th I believe it was $4 million. And it was portrayed in the media and on late night TV shows as um, 
a lawsuit's gone wild, that it was uh, somebody who should have exercised personal responsibility and is blaming this big corporation for her own failings. And uh, the creators of the tort tale concept, um, Michael McCann and William Halton, talk about that case as illustrating the tort tale concept, that, it, that the sound bite of, oh, the lady spills coffee on herself and sues for millions of dollars, that soundbite stripped away details of the case that were much more legitimate. The fact that she required an extensive hospital stay, the fact that uh, she offered to settle with McDonald's, but they gave her, her their offer was far below the medical expenses, uh, the fact that McDonald's was serving coffee at an unsafe temperature, and so on and so forth. And so what uh, Halteman McCann argue is that tort reform drew strength from these tort tales in the late 20th century. And what I'm trying to show in this particular chapter, not as the main point, but as a one substory, is that the story of tort reform has a much longer history than previously thought of. We tend to think of tort reform as happening after the culture wars of the 1960s, but the roots of tort reform, even though it wasn't called that necessarily, stretch back to much earlier in the century. Yeah, I, I, I frankly see, I don't see any Stormy Daniels connection after seeing well, 60 Minutes last night, but I, I'm, I, was, I was thinking of McDonald's coffee, but also, um, Ronald Reagan's welfare queen, but that wasn't really tort reform, I suppose. And and, um, and currently, the millions and millions of illegal voters who uh, kept, like like Im illegal immigrants voting and keeping um, Donald Trump from getting a majority. But um, my question about about the examples you gave were, do you have any thoughts about the underlying motivation? for why these devil characters were so popular. It, it, it seems like they're, it's coming from different directions. So mm -hmm. I, I thought you made a really interesting point that in some cases it was feminists who were seeing a different version of marriage who were in, interested in these, these devils, but then it was also traditional people. Do you have thoughts about, was there, some, was there one underlying motivation or multiple motivations that all would focus on the, these same characters? I, I think that the, the construction of the gold digger is being driven by those multiple forces. And on some level, it's political, whether uh, traditional politics and demonizing the gold digger uh, for being a greedy, uppity woman, or progressive politics criticizing the gold digger for representing this outdated model of marriage. But then I think there is a, a kind of popular culture or aesthetic dimension to the gold digger in that viewers of those 1930 films were, in a sense, taking pleasure in the stylization of the gold digger without necessarily thinking about alimony or heart bomb or something like that. And it's that confluence between the political and the popular culture element that, that is why the gold digger has such a, a force. And I, I liked your comment about welfare reform. I've often thought about that and the, the kind of, um, the welfare queen as a kind of neoliberal gold digger figure, but that's a later chapter. Thank you for the talk. I thought it was really interesting. And I think your last comment probably builds into part of the question that I had. So a lot of the examples that you use are all white women around mm -hmm. this kind of construction of gold digger as a concept. But some of the discussions of the Harlem lawsuits brought up black men and white women. How much is this initial construct really racialized? And how do you see that kind of changing over time? Yeah, that's a great, a great question. I think the gold digger figure in the early 20th century is almost uh, explicitly a racialized as white. And if you look at uh, film scholar Richard Dyer, he has uh, some really smart analysis about representations of uh, Marilyn Monroe in particular as, and, and Jean Harlow is representing this kind of I iconic whiteness. But the representations of gold diggers as we get later in the 20th century and the racialization of the gold digger, I think, 
I haven't quite worked out the analytic account of it, but I think it has something to do with intra-racial uh, class stratification. So a widening rich-poor gap within African Americans. Uh, and thereby, after the 1960s, there might be more gold to dig, in a sense. And so there might be uh, heightened representations of African American gold diggers. But it's a, a piece I haven't quite worked out yet. But if you have any thoughts on it, please talk to me afterwards, because it's something I'm trying to work through. Uh, that was kind of my question. I was going to ask if you thought the gold digger figure was a white thing. But I was thinking about um, the incorporation of gold digger into like black vernacular with popular culture with Ray Charles, Kanye West. And you've, if you thought about that as more of a welfare queen image or how that moved into the gold digger image? I, one thing that I've noticed about the racialization of the gold digger figure and the use of the gold digger in black vernacular is th that it captures what Eve Dunbar calls um, non-liberatory agency. So it's a figure that is speaking back to power and is subversive and resistive, uh, but in a way that is very much contained and is not necessarily posing a threat to um, the, the dominant social order. Um, and I think that within the, going back a bit to, with, within the representations of white gold diggers, there's often an unspoken referent. That is that the reason that there is a panic or concern about explicitly white gold diggers is that they are making white women look bad in a sense and uh, are being corrupted in a kind of racialized way. And I think part of that is the racialization or um, use of ethnic tropes to describe their lawyers. So it's not a coincidence, I don't think, that in the first clip they're going to Havana to do their gold digging. Uh, in uh, Lawyer Man, uh, William Powell is playing a lawyer who got his start on the Lower East Side and then uh, uh, moved up the, the legal ladder, if you will, and was using his kind of street smarts that he developed on the Lower East Side to defend these breach of promise gold diggers. And then, of course, in the um, I'm No Angel clip, Mae West, her lawyer, is, is speaking with accented English and is um, representing a, someone who wouldn't be characterized as a, quote, native-born white during the 1930s. And so it's interesting what the gold diggers as white women uh, are representing, but, what they're, uh, but they're also representing something the, um, through inversion, if you will. Uh, thank you for your talk. I was just wondering if at the same time of the gold digger um, representations, you'd notice the masculinity side, the sugar daddy icons, and kind of how these emerge along with the gold diggers. That's great, yes. So one thing I've noticed, especially with reference to the early 20th century, is that the representations of gold diggers is a comment on the men with whom they are digging. So Stanley Joyce was consistently portrayed as a, quote, stage door Johnny. And he was uh, described as walking behind Peggy Hopkins Joyce. And he was described as being kind of feminine and soft in his, uh, in his demeanor. And likewise, I talked about how Peaches Browning was described as this gold digger. But Edward Browning was also very much criticized in the press. And those criticisms lined up with critiques of hegemonic masculinity. Or, uh, what I mean by that is that he was criticized for not embodying hegemonic masculinity, that he was um, spending time with young women when he should be with people his own age. It's, it's a good question. Thank you.